Well, I, I disagree with it. I am a supporter of affirmative action, but it is something that um, as a lawyer, ever since the beginning of my career, I understood that it was really hanging by a thread because the Supreme Court has never been fully 100% unambiguously in support of affirmative action. Even where they have said that it can be allowed, they have talked about it as if it will end someday, it has to end, and they've talked about it with a lot of ambivalence. And so in 2003, when the court decided Grutter versus Bollinger, that was a time when people thought that this court was going to strike down affirmative action, and it did not, um, because of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who was the swing vote. She voted with the liberals and saved affirmative action at the time. But at that time, I think that lawyers who were watching the court very closely knew that that was kind of like by the skin of our teeth and that the time would come when the court would have a different composition and that affirmative action was not going to last forever. And so it's not a big surprise that it is happening now with the court being composed as it is with six conservatives. Um, but it is something that, I, though I disagree with it, I think the, the approach now is to look at all the ways in which reaction to this decision will create opportunities to really dig in to the inequities that exist in our society and the inequality in educational opportunity. And, you know, it's put, gonna put a lot of selective schools to the test. Do they have what it takes? Do they have the commitment to actually work with this decision around it, to comply with it, and yet still try to increase diversity, to repair social harm, and to look at so societal inequality and do some things that they can do without actually considering race. Yeah, absolutely. It does seem like this is going to be quite a test of a lot of institutions' commitment uh, to diversity and, and their ability to continue to uh, produce it. Uh, Charles, both the affirmative action case and the student debt decision disproportionately impact black Americans. They carry more student loan debt than any other uh, group. Talk to us about the real impact of this ruling, and then talk to us also about the message it's sending to black Americans. Well, Secretary Castro, first I have to start with the remarks of my alma mater's president, uh, Howard University President uh, Wayne Frederick, who talked about the fact that this is going to put an inordinate amount of strain on HBCUs going forward, because now it's immeasurable to know how many people are not going to apply to certain institutions because for fear of getting rejected and simply put that strain on historically black colleges and universities who will who without additional funding won't be able to manage this additional workload that they're going to be asked to shoulder on behalf of Americans who want to go to college and want a quality education but may be denied entrance despite being qualified to certain other institutions so that's important to understand but then Speaking more broadly, it's also very, very critical that we note access to a college education is, in many respects, access to the American dream. You go to college, you get an internship, that can oftentimes open doors to professional pursuits, to your earning potential, all sorts of things that we connect with upward mobility in American society. By denying that, by taking away affirmative action and leaving us to operate in a society that's basically supposed to be colorblind, but that we know is marked by systemic inequity and racial uh, and continued racial discrimination, those things ultimately cut that off at the at the knee. And it's very unfortunate because it's going to disproportionately affect black learners, black families, and the black community at a very, very high rate. Well, and Charles, of course, the president addressed uh, both the affirmative action decision and the student loan debt decision. And on student loans, the president was quick to say that his administration would, would pursue other options for student debt relief uh, to, to address the issue in a different way. Is there anything keeping, though, the conservative supermajority on the court from stopping that effort as well? Right now, it doesn't appear so, although it will be interesting to watch how this plays out. President Biden is relying on a relatively uh, old and, and seldom used provision that the Department of Education will be using in order to try and create relief. It's a longer path and not, not as direct a path as what we saw the court strike down, but it is something that appears to be solid legally, although it will be uh, available to fewer uh, borrowers that will be looking to get their student, lo student loans relief. But to that point and to the point of our conversation about disproportionate impact, it's important to understand that, on average, black learners 
who have borrowed from, you know, borrowed for their college education carry over 188 percent in most cases on average student debt that's higher than their white counterparts. So when you talk about the disproportionate impact of having this struck down and the way that this pretty much is standing as a barrier not only to general generational wealth, but to continuing the notion of generational debt, this is such a very significant thing that I think cannot be overstated. And so it will be interesting to see how Joe Biden's new efforts to try and get student debt relief on the table move forward and how many people he can actually cover as compared to the law, which was, or the policy, which is basically struck, struck down by the Supreme Court this week.